Uh, good morning. Thanks, everyone, for coming to our session. Uh, hopefully, we're back on track here time-wise now, so stick with your agenda for the rest of the day, please. I'm um, happy to introduce uh, Eben. He's a Couchbase uh, employee, uh, user advocate, senior engineer. And if, if, the, if you read the last talk where Matt was talking about uh, SDKs and how developers can do things, I, I picture Eben's talk as a bit more of the uh, Swiss Army knife of all the other things that you should really should know that uh, maybe we don't always tell you about. But uh, so take it away. Thanks. OK. Ooh, yes. I'm, I'm turned on. Uh, good morning. I am Eben Haber. And I'm going to be talking about a number of different developer features. Uh, so that's me. Um, my, the title I adopted when I came to Couchbase was uh, Senior Software Engineer and User Advocate. So my, my goal uh, is, as an engineer, to go, out into, to go out and talk to actual users and try and figure out where their pain points are and bring that into the engineering organization and come up with ideas to solve those problems. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll do online surveys or talk to people, and, and my favorite question is, you know, what is the thing you, that you really like about using Catchbase? What makes it work well for you? And then the flip side of that is, what is the most difficult thing about using Catchbase that really, really brings you down? So um, what you're going to be seeing are sort of things that have come out of those issues. I'm going to be talking about a bunch of different things, and I think since I've got 40 minutes, and this is you know, maybe a 25, 30 minute talk, I'll have room for questions and also room for a demo. Um, there are several different parts of this. I'm going to be talking about the query workbench, which is the web-based UI for doing nickel querying, uh, query monitoring, which is a new feature in 5.0, which allows uh, for understanding what queries are going on, uh, talking about import-export tools, and finally, just general uh, discussions of the Couchbase web console. Now, um, talking, talking with the audience just before the talk, it sounds like a number of you are quite new to Couchbase, so um, I'll, I'll try and give you enough context to understand how these features fit in to uh, the system as a whole. So starting with the query workbench. Um, one of my favorite aspects of Couchbase, and the thing that really made me join the company almost three years ago, is the nickel query language. So it is a query language that is compatible with SQL 92. So it's a basically building on top of SQL 92. So it is a very familiar model of programming. Um, and yet it is extended to this new world of uh, schemaless document uh, documents in the JSON format. So in 4.5, we introduced a, uh, a web-based query workbench that allowed people to um, run their queries, see the results. Um, we added a number of nice features, such as you, know, you can see the results in JSON, but you can also see the results in a tabular form, because it can flatten the JSON out and make it appear as tables or nested tables, uh, show it as a tree, that sort of thing. Um, the biggest, you know, so in 4.5, we had this basic uh, query workbench. You could run your queries. It was very nice. But um, one of the biggest problems, and I, you know, I read the Couchbase forums every day, and perhaps the most common question on the Nickel forums is, my query's running too slowly. Please, you know, what is, it, what is going on here? And the answer is always, well, you, just like in SQL, you run explain, and it will give you the query plan, and then the query plans that Couchbase produces are fairly complicated. Um, they're hard to understand. So uh, what I wanted to do in this release was give people a better view on the query plans. So um, one of the things is that now, instead of just being able to run queries, we also have an explain button. So you can just you can take the current state of your query, run explain, and you can see the, uh, the textual form of the query plan. Uh, in addition, as you're running queries in your browser, each time you run a query, doing, uh, getting the explain plan is a very quick operation, 10 milliseconds. So every query you run from the query workbench, it will generate a plan for it, and it will keep that plan around as long as you're in your browser session. So that allows you to go back and say, oh, well, I've run 10 different versions of my query. Let's compare the query plans for each one. Um, the work... Uh, 
in addition, there's a new feature in 5.0 called collect timings that happens on the server. When you have collect timings turned on, it, for every single query operation, will record how much time the query engine spent in that query operator. Um, so when you run a query, uh, when the results come back, you also get indications of how much time we're spent in each query operator, which is a big help in understanding how to, uh, wh where you need to focus if you want your query to run faster. And then, best of all, um, the, we now support visual query plans. Now, uh, the textual query plans in Couchbase, they're in JSON format, they can be lengthy, they can be hard to read, there's a lot of nesting going on. Um, and so we came up with a way of showing this as essentially a data flow diagram where you can see uh, the different query operators and how the, uh, the documents are moving through the uh, query execution. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we provide summary information so you can see uh, what indexes are being used. You can see all the buckets that are being used. All, so summar uh, summary information to help you understand the overall query. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the query timings. Once you run the query, you can see the time spent per operator, the cost of each operator, the number of items going in and out, um, and it highlights expensive operations. So this is an example of the visual query plan. Um, right now, we, we back and forth about the right way of organizing this. It is It goes from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So all your data sources are all the way on the right, and then the documents flow through these query operators and end up all the way on the left. Um, the coloring of these operators are an indication of approximately how expensive they are. There are several different uh, thresholds. So if, if an operator is gray, it's negligible. It's less than 1% of the total query time. Uh, if it has a little bit of gold, then it was more, a more expensive operation, and if it's, all, if it's all the way filled up with gold, that indicates that it took more than 20% of the total query execution time. So just in looking at this, you can say, oh, well, let's see, we've got a filter down here. You know, uh, perhaps that's something that might be sped up if we had a different kind of index. Um, the idea is just, just by looking at it, uh, giving you uh, a view on, um, on what parts of the query are causing it to take time. Also note at the top, we have a list of indexes. So you can, you can say, ah, well, let's see, which indexes are this query using, and maybe it should be using different indexes. What buckets are being used, and what fields? A quick question, though. Oh, yeah, sure. So the, the load time is something that is just a browser-based content UI. Is this all happening on the, can you explain yes. where this is happening? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so, sorry, I guess I, I needed even more context. So, um, so this is a view of the Couchbase web-based administrative console. And uh, this is where you could go to configure, uh, to monitor your Couchbase cluster. It's all based on Couchbase's REST API, so this is all stuff that you can do uh, just using any application and via REST, but this provides a, a very nice look on it. And the query workbench is this part right here where you can enter your queries. Um, you can look at the uh, buckets, the data containers that you have on your system. Um, so that, that is the context. So is, do, does that answer your question? Yeah, but the, the diagram is through the yes. filter. Where does this come from? Oh, okay, so uh, let's say, let's, um, let's see, yeah, so I need to, uh, Okay, that one isn't ready to run. Let me find a query. Um, okay, so, so here's a query on one of my buckets. And um, so I can run the query. I can, I can view the results as raw JSON. Because there's a regular structure here, I can also view this as a table. Um, and I can look at the query plan that uh, of that query. So this is coming from the query server? Or from yes. The server? Yeah, so, so what happens is when you run a query, uh, before you run the query, it spends 10 milliseconds getting the query plan. And um, 
And there are actually two, two versions of this. If you just run the explain plan, you get a very plain plan because it doesn't know how much time the operators are gonna take. But when you actually run the query itself, the query results come back with uh, how much time was spent in each operator. And another question, yes. Ah, um, the color scheme, the question is, is the color scheme configurable? And the answer is uh, not right now. That's, uh, the, that's the first request we've had for it, but that's, that's an interesting thing. Or would you, uh, are, do you just prefer different colors or is there, do you have colorblind users? Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, talk, talk, to, uh, talk to me and, or well, let's see, yes. Uh, Rob, do you have? Uh, see, 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 more, see more, but read less. Um, okay, so the, this is the, um, the query workbench, so back to my presentation. Um, so, uh, part two in, uh, or the next, the next thing I wanted to talk about is schema inferencing. Now, Couchbase as a document store does not enforce schemas. That's just the way it is. You could, every document that you could put in Couchbase could be a completely different structure from every other document, and Couchbase would still be able to handle it just fine because it, it really is coming out of um, a world of key value stores. But, this being business data, you're really going to find common structures in the documents in your, uh, in your, in your data. And so because of that, um, one of the things I found when I first joined Couchbase was write, being able to write queries is great, but if you don't know what the field names are, it's really hard to write good queries. Um, so what, couch ba what I added, a feature I created is called schema inferencing. And what it does is it takes a random sample, by default, a thousand documents, and it finds what common, data st what common document structures there are. Uh, and so this is really nice. In the UI, on the right-hand side of the UI is a list of the various data buckets, and if you expand them, you can actually see uh, it will show you the results of that schema inferencing. It will say, okay, I found, uh, for example, in the game sim sample, there are three different common data structures, um, and they have these different fields, and it will show you what the field types are, and so on. So, um, inf so this is a command in the nickel language called infer, and the, the user interface is using that to show you that information so that you can know what the fields are to write your queries. It is worth noting that, that because this is random sampling, um, the, schema in, the schemas that are inferred might change or they might miss particularly rare documents. So if you have one, say, master document that is a different structure from all the rest, you might not pull it up from your random sample. Um, in 5.0, uh, we've made some improvements. So uh, in schema inferencing was added in version 4.5. In 5.0, we've improved that. So now schema inferencing runs in the background whenever you launch the, the workbench. So as soon as you bring it up, it's running the schema inferencing in the background so that those schemas are available. Uh, what this means is that all the field names are known. So when you're writing a query, it will do auto-completion on field names. Um, and um, I can show you an example of that. Let's see, I think I'll make this bigger again. So uh, let's see, I've got, I've got a, a bucket called beer. And so if, I, if I'm writing a query and I say select star from uh, beer, and I can auto-complete the bucket name, which is nice. Um, this bucket name has a dash in it, which is why it has the backward single quotes around it, and I can say where, and I've got a field called address, and so I just hit tab, and it auto-completes that. Um, if I actually want to know what form a particular field has, I can, if I mouse over it, it will give me sample data values that it found during the schema inferencing, so I can say, ah, well, let's say 
country, is that a name? Yeah, it looks like a name. Um, phone, uh, I can mouse over that and it will give me examples of phone numbers so I can see what format those are in. Yes? So you have your, your query probably comes in as a zero or something. Yes. Ah. So in, the, in this particular data set, and I'm not sure if you could, so the question had to do with the different document types. So it, this, is, this is a sample data set that we send out, and there are two different document types in the bucket. One is breweries and one is beer, and they actually have different sets of fields. The schema inferencing is able to detect this, and not only that, um, because it's, it's collecting sample values, it is able to say, oh, well, I noticed that for all the documents that have this structure, there's one field that only has a single value for this, and that's the type field. So it doesn't know that the type field is special, but is it, it is able to determine that just by saying, oh, well, for all these documents, there's only one value for this, and that's the type having the value brewery. And the same for documents with this structure down here, they all have the type equals beer. And it also says, oh, well, they also have the type UPC equals zero, so that's probably an artifact of the data. Okay. My question was, right now you're, you're clearly talking about the zeros, right? Yes. That's why you know you have added. Yes. But for the, at the, at the, when you type your query, you can say at every end, type equals zero in that case, right? Yes. So it's a valid field, but probably it won't return anything, right? Well, yes, yeah, so, exactly, yes. Yeah. So, so you, you have to know, well, let's see. So. You could, if you say where address and you qualify the address, if the address field is missing, then you won't get any of the beer documents. And uh, I guess the, the, the goal of the schema inferencing is to help you know, oh, well, I have these different structures, these fields are present here, and, and I should either use the type field or, make, or use a where clause that includes is not missing to make sure I'm getting the, getting the appropriate fields. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry, yes. So, Ah, so 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 you're at, so I could write a query saying um, yeah. uh, select type from beer sample where address is not missing. Is is that what you're asking? Yeah. So I can um, and gives me a, a lot of different answers or a lot of different uh, record uh, documents. So I can say select distinct. So this is just like querying in SQL and say, give me the uh, distinct types, and says, oh, okay, there's. Yes, it, it, so, so if a field has a different type, it should show it more than once, because, um, Yes, having having a di having a different type is sort of they really are different things. But I haven't I haven't checked that in a while, so I, I I'm not 100 percent sure. Any any more questions? Yes, it, it, that, that if you have a field with different types, it should list it more than once. Okay, so um, one other interesting thing about having schema inferencing at our disposal is um, a big limitation of Couchbase because we don't have a schema, we, we, we don't have a schema to enforce is that if you mistype a field name, that is not a syntax error. If you, if you mistype a field name in a traditional relational database, you'll get a syntax error saying the, the name that you type does not exist. It's not, it's not part of the schema that we know about. Um, in the case here, um, I'm doing schema inferencing so I can, act, I mean, so without this, uh, you know, normally if you run a query in Couchbase and you mistype a field name, it's, 
Couchbase doesn't know that that field doesn't exist. There might be a document somewhere that has that field. So it proceeds assuming that that field might be somewhere and tries to apply the, the where clause based on that field. And as a result, if you mistype a field name, oftentimes you get a result, an unexpected result. Um, you know, if I asked for where type with a capital T equals beer, um, I'd get no, no records back at all. So what I'm doing, what I do now is, because I have the query plan, which helps me know all the fields that are referred to in the query, and I'm doing the uh, schema inferencing, which lets me know all the fields that are found at least in a random sample of documents, I can issue a warning if I see a field used which wasn't found in the inferred schemas. And so that, you know, th there, are, there are limitations to that, you know, I, but it is a help in, it, it is a help to the user in flagging things that might be an error. Um, you know, there, there will be false positives where it will give you this warning message if you are referring to a field that's very, very rare and wasn't picked up in the scheme inferencing. And you'll get false negatives because the um, very complicated subqueries don't get fully analyzed in the query plan. And thus, I can't see, um, I don't have visibility into what those fields are. Um, query history. So um, since a lot of you are new to Couchbase, I'll just, I'll show you that a little bit. So um, in version 4.5, uh, the, the, we had a history of queries where you could just go backward and forward. Um, and so if you ran a query, you could go back and try it again or edit it. Um, and what I found was uh, talking to the query team that very quickly they would have thousands and thousands of queries in their query history because this, uh, the history of queries will persist across browser sessions. So you know, if you had a really good query you ran yesterday, you're able to go back and find it, but if you have thousands of queries, it might be hard to find it. So in 5.0, we have a query history dialog, which lets you scroll through. I, I just set up this cluster yesterday, so I've only got about 30 queries here. Um, so I can look through it and, you know, let's say I'm interested in the format for the prepare command for prepared queries. I can actually search and for, on a given keyword. It will show me just those and I can say, oh, well, let's see. Uh, let's bring this one up here and then I have the query right there where I can either run it or I can edit it, change it and run it as is. Um, Um, the history does not st store the timestamps um, across, well, let's see. So across browser sessions, uh, it only stores the text of the queries because uh, local storage in the browser is limited to five megabytes and I, I uh, didn't want to store too much. Um, when, if you are in the same browser session, it will store, and you've run queries, it will store the results or it will, it will keep the results around, how long a query took to execute, um, and the number, the number of uh, documents that were returned and the size. Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so the, the question is, yeah, could we have the timestamp to help me find out when I ran something? That's a, that's a great idea, I'll have to, but it will have to be in a future version of Couchbase. Okay. Okay. Um, query preferences. So, oh, yeah. Was there a question? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, I'll. That is slightly later in my talk. So, I'll. I'll, I'll move on to that in a second. Uh, so, we have preferences. Yeah. When you're running queries from the command line, it's possible to set a number of pre or, or through the REST API, it's possible to set a number of parameters, uh, preference, and these are now settable also in the UI. So we can set uh, the max parallelism to see how many threads the query engine is gonna run. You can specify the, the consistency pattern, uh, the parameters. Um, you can use positional name parameters which are used in prepared queries and you can specify uh, a query timeout time. Um, finally, um, in Version 4.5, we could export query results as a file. Now in version 5.0, we can uh, import and export queries themselves. So if you've got a query in a file that you really wanna run, 
um, you can do that. So query monitoring, um, Couchbase, this is a feature that added, uh, that was added, so getting to your question, in, um, in 4.5 it added node-specific node query monitoring, and in 5.0 it's now global in that across your cluster it's possible to see all the queries that are currently running. You can also see um, the most recent long-running queries that finished, so uh, by default it stores uh, 4K or 4,096 of queries that took longer than a second to run. So if you want to know what queries are taking a lot of time on your system, those are available. Um, and then it also keeps aggregate statistics on prepared queries. So if you have a, a prepared query that's running in your application, um, you can say, oh, well, let's see, this one was run uh, 10,000 times and the average time uh, it will tell you. So um, I'll just go over to the UI and show you that. So query monitoring. Um, since I use a query to find out what queries are currently running, um, there's always at least one query running uh, in this list. Um, I could start a script and run some other queries in the background. Let's see, I have some uh, completed queries. I just started this uh, cluster recently, so I only have a few queries that uh, I just started up and then yes, oh yeah, I don't have my prepared queries because I uh, restarted the cluster. But this, this allows an administrator to know what queries are currently running um, there and what queries have run the long, have taken the longest to run. Uh, finally, in terms of tooling, um, since a lot of you are new to Couchbase, uh, we have a number of different ways that you can use to get your data into Couchbase. And this is really handy when you just wanna get going. Um, we have a tool called CB Import, and it can import CSV files and it can import JSON files. So the CSV files, it converts into JSON documents based on the field names in the first line of the CSV file. Um, JSON, uh, it just imports as is. Um, and CB export is a tool for doing, um, you, you can only export as JSON because there's, um, J, J, exporting a CSV is a much harder problem because you can have nested data and arrays and uh, putting that into a comma separated format. There is, there is not a well-defined way of doing that. Um, yes? Uh, s sorry, so I, I couldn't quite hear that. Yes. Yes. So the the import and export tools um, we had earlier versions of them, but they've been rewritten in 5.0. Uh, they're multi-threaded. They can they can run much faster, and so they can um, so th they should be suitable for much larger data sets. Um, you know, how big is big? Well. <laughs> uh, they, 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 they should work for a lot of different things. And just, um, and then there's one other example that I'll show you, so let's see. So I have a, um, let me. Okay, so for example, I, I looked online, I found a data set of uh, baby names for the last five years in New York City, and that's a CSV file and I can just run uh, CB import and I give it the name of the cluster and I give it a file name and then I also tell it what I want the key for each document to be and I can refer to the fields in the CSV file and I can just run that and that was a few thousand and if I go over to my query node, uh, oops, uh, I can now say, ah, well I've got 8,000 names that got loaded in um, and it tells and tells me what those fields are. So um, that's one way of doing it. There's another really interesting way that got added in version four dot, or I mean, sorry, in version five dot o, and that is we now have something called um, a curl function in Nickel, which lets you actually go out on the web, pull in some JSON, and let's see, let's find my uh, query. Okay, yes, yeah. so um, one of the ways you can import queries is just by dragging a file to, uh, 
to the workbench. So this is a query that says run, run curl against Yelp and uh, with, with certain authorization tokens. And um, I'm going to load that into my default bucket. And what this is asking for is the nearest restaurant, since it's almost lunchtime here. Um, so now I've got, I have uh, the 20 nearest restaurants are in here. And I can actually say uh, select star from default. And so this, this will show me the JSON, which you know, perhaps is uh, a little bit voluminous. So uh, here I've got a tabular view. And you can see how some of these rows in the table, we have nested tables because that's the nature of JSON. But I can go over here, and uh, let's see. Here I've got names, I've got ratings, uh, I've got the price. So let's see, let's sort this by price. So here are the cheapest restaurants. Gives me the names, I have uh, addresses, and so on. So um, it just went out to Yelp, it got all the, uh, it got the data from the Yelp API, and then put it in as JSON into uh, Couchbase. So, um, that can be another nice way of quickly getting data into Couchbase, either from a file or, or from a web source. Um, so in general, if for those of you who are familiar with Couchbase 4.5, uh, we've made a lot of changes to the UI in 5.0. We've made it much more responsive. We've added a bunch of new features, also a new design. Um, in addition, it's also responsive. So if you really, really need to uh, use it on your phone, it actually will, uh, will work. You can, uh, you, know, you can monitor your servers, you can basically run queries on a very small screen. Um, and, uh, and also the navigation has been improved a great deal. And I think I did all the, all the demonstration throughout, the, throughout my talk, so just about on time. Um, I will finish up and answer any more questions that you have. Yeah, any questions? We got a mic because it's uh, we're uh, streaming this live, and we also want to. It's hard to hear at the front. Any questions? So uh, hi, um, I have a question about uh, running the queries overall. So, like, uh, let's say you had a query that uh, would be based on the type of the document. So you say, for example, if the type equals something. What exactly happens on servers? Am I right that it has to scan all of the documents, in, assuming that there is no index on the type document? Yes. Well, yes. Yeah. So, so, no so, so just just as with any any database, if you don't have an index, it's got to do a table scan, and uh, and so a big part of getting cache-based queries to run quickly is finding the appropriate indexes that will make your queries run faster. On, on relational databases, now there is another question for that. There was a way to actually give hint to their engine of yep. database saying, okay, use this index because yes. it might be actually resulting in fa Do we have something like that? Here? Yeah, yeah. Or so, so having multiple indexes might actually make the query runtime even worse than like one index. Uh, ah, yeah. so, 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 so both those statements are true. So uh, uh, we do have hints. So you can say, try and use this index. There are times where using, an index, using one index might be much slower than using a different index. So you want to push it in that direction. Um, but that's, that's a sub, uh, use, indexing uh, and queries is a subject of actually, I believe, a different, an entirely different talk here today. So oh, go ahead, yeah, uh, look that up, and hopefully it hasn't happened yet. Okay, thank you. It, don't mention any other talks, because that's in another session, and everybody just needs to stay here today. My question is, uh, can I write uh, multiple conditions in the filter? Uh, one can be a part of the JSON index, and the other one, no index, other field. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, absolutely. So this this is just uh, so the, the, the as I hear your question, you're saying, can I have multiple conditions in my query? Mm -hmm. And the answer is absolutely. It's just like uh, a SQL query where you can say where this and this and this and this, and you can have as many many conditions as you want. You can have it refer to a subquery, um, and so you know that it it's it is it is literally an extension on SQL ninety two. So. You know, any, any query you could write in SQL 92, you can write in this and more. And so um, the, you know, the, the, only, the only issue is that you know, depending upon the conditions and the selectivity of the conditions and where, where you have indexes, um, 
you know, you, you, you don't want to end up in a situation where you're ending up doing an, a table scan, because that's, that's the slowest way of, I mean, you, you know, so hopefully you have a highly selective index and then you can do a scan, then, then you are applying your conditions to the results of that index so that, um, so that the query will run more quickly. Uh, I'm just wondering when we query, uh, when you store the data, the whole documents in the database, are you storing as the file as is or some other format? And when you query it, is it going to look for the real text or something different? Okay, so the, the question is how is the data stored? And so right now, on di in memory, the data is stored pretty much as, as you see it. Uh, when it goes out to disk, it is, it is stored in a compressed format, so it takes up less space. Um, so for regular for regular operations, it just it deals with a document. Um, there are sub document operations which are used, which you can use through the SDK, or also Nickel uses to a certain degree, where it will um, it will only look at parts of the document and not have to move the whole document back and forth. Does that does that answer your question? I think the uh, schema inference is a great feature. It's very useful, I think. Uh, what I'm wondering, like, uh, uh, how do you do it? Can you share, like, the algorithm and methods you used to uh, develop that great feature? Um, I, I, I could probably talk about it for half an hour, so. Um, Bad question, then. Bad yeah. It is not, it is not particularly, um, it, it, it is complicated in that there are lots of corner cases that you have to deal with in terms of nested, you know, how, how to deal with arrays, how to deal with nested objects. But it really is a matter of turning each document into, into a schema and then comparing the schemas and seeing which schemas belong together and which schemas are separate. I assume it's using some sampling? Yes, yeah. It, 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 it is, Based on a random sample, the, the schemas that you see over here are based on a sample of a thousand documents, and it's able to do that in you know un, well under a second. Um, the um, it is also possible to run it from the, as a nickel command, and then you can say whatever sample size you want. So if you wanted to sample every document, you could. It would take longer, but then you would actually have a schema that represented your entire data set. Uh, last question. So I just saw yeah, uh, you were running some prepared segments. Yes. Um, so I believe that is something that you can only do through the web console. Uh, uh, no, uh, you, so or can you do that from the SDK as well? Yeah, yeah. so uh, prepared statements can be run anywhere you can run a nickel command. So, um, and in fact, the real reason to have a prepared statement is because you want it to be part of your application to make your application run faster. Um, so that you don't have, so that the query engine doesn't have to come up with a query plan every time. Um, and so, I guess y usually what would happen would be that that the developer would create a prepared statement that would make their query run faster, and they might do it here. Uh, but you could do it from the command line or 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 via an SDK. Um, but then actually executing the prepared statement is is something that your application would be more likely to do. Okay, so let's see there. I say, you know, prepare this, prepare this query, which is just giving me, uh, oh, let's see, oh yeah, prepare as. I say, okay, so this, this, this prepared, prepared the query, and then somewhere I've got uh, execute, which is, and what's, if I just try and execute the query, since I, ha I haven't specified the, uh, value, or well, no, I guess, yeah, this is, let's say, five. So I need to give it a value, and, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, never mind, I'm not, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's the wrong query to run, and I don't have time to fix that right now. No, well, the prepared statements will, will live as long as the cluster's running. So if you restart the cluster, then the prepared statements uh, Yes, and so you need to bring them up again. That's great. Uh, thanks a lot, Evan. That's a great overview. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the great questions. 
Uh, you have uh, a few minutes till lunch has started, so I'm sure we can stick around and a answer some more questions. Um, the You have uh, an hour uh, for lunch until 1 p.m., and then you have another keynote before this session continues again in this room talking about specifically database migrations. So as everyone's moving certain workloads, say, from their legacy database into a scalable couch-based environment, uh, you can come and learn from our developer advocate, uh, um, Matthew Groves to learn some of those tricks and best practices. So we'll see you back here at 2.30. Thank you.